2009, certainly yes, the Environment Committee uh, conducted an inquiry into climate change. Uh, that was before my time. And the aim of the inquiry was to understand the implications of climate change for Northern Ireland and to make recommendations on government policies and to mitigate the impacts of climate change, examine economic implications and identify uh, suitable adaptation initiatives. As some of you may be aware, I think the minister uh, was yesterday or day before, I think it was just yesterday, uh, announced uh, the Northern Ireland Adaptation Programme. Uh, whether it's to coincide with Lord Devon's uh, 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 visit to Northern Ireland, I don't know, I don't want to speculate. But certainly we've been waiting for this for a long time. So I look forward to, to reading uh, the, the, uh, the document. Um, I must say, I suppose to the exchange today, um, I couldn't call it disappointing, but in a way it was a bit predictable of our politicians today between their comments and not Devon's comments. I mean, it's open session and anyone could go back and read, read the comments or the exchanges. And some people are saying, oh, they're still skeptical of scientific evidence. I think that is just, like, that could be tragic for all of us if we still have politicians arguing that they don't believe climate change is here. They don't believe that we need to take measures you know, to address it. I mean, I think Lord Deben made a very, very good uh, analogy. He's saying, we all pay for fire insurance of our home, although 99.8% of us would probably never, never need to claim it, never need to use it, and we probably all don't want it, obviously. Don't want to have to, to, to uh, uh, cash or use that policy. But we all pay for it. We all pay 150, 200 pounds for it because there is that little risk that we may need it. And it's the same with climate change. You know, some of us may say, you know, yeah, 95% of, of science, uh, of the bulk of science said it will happen. There's still 5% of uncertainty. But what are we going to do if it's going to really that, um, you know, even with that 5% of uncertainty, we still have to ensure that if it happens, that you know we or that that it is uh, that we have measures to protect ourselves against it. So I think it was a very good message, and I'm sorry I just think I'm not going to read it. I've, I've taken long enough time of of uh, Dr. O'Sullivan's uh, uh, presentation. So I look forward to hearing you this afternoon. Thank you. Again, just one preliminary comment, actually, in response to what to what you said um, before I, before I go into the, the presentation. Um, the KES uh, seminar series, which the Open University are delighted to be to, to, to be part of this year, um, even the sort of the, the mission statement, if you like, on the front slide there, evidence-based policy. Um, there is no firmer evidence-based policy in the whole world than the science behind you know human effects on climate change. So, and this talk, you'll be glad to know, I'm not a scientist. It's not a science talk because really the issues are political and they're economic, and and that's really what's holding us back. Um, so. Again, so that, thank you for that introduction. There are three main arguments in my presentation today, um, which I'm going to sort of uh, outline. Um, firstly, I, I'd like to propose that we, we need to rethink both our economic priorities and how we measure social progress. Secondly, that in the pursuit at the moment of economic growth, the good life, prosperity, call it what you will, we are actually systematically undermining or on eroding the very basis of our well-being for tomorrow. Um, carrying on with business as usual is, is not actually an option and it is actually unsustainable. The third general overall argument I'd like to make, um, and this is looking at some numbers, that some maths, is that we simply can't burn all our fossil fuel reserves. There is a limit, a carbon budget, in the sort of the common parlance now, to which we must adhere, must stick to. 
And because of that, we, we need to reinvent our energy systems. So those are the three main sort of arguments I'd like to get across and I'm going to be outlining. And they may be sort of maybe global in scale or hi high level, but um, what I'd like to do when, when I finish and maybe as a prompt for further discussion is sort of pose two questions at the end and about which I'd be interested in, in people's views as well. Um, what is stopping us acting? You know, why aren't we doing more? And secondly, again, on a very local, uh, direct level, you know, why does this matter to Northern Ireland? You know, what, what can we do? So, so the first thing I want to do, really do is look at um, what I think are sort of two fundamental problems or issues we have with how we measure social progress today in the world, particularly in, in the Western world, Northern world, and how we conceptualize and frame economic growth, economics as discipline. Both have enormous implications for environmental and economic policy. And I'm going to start with a speech that was made 45 years ago. Uh, JFK Kennedy was in the news recently, obviously, because of the tragic anniversary 50 years of, of his assassination. But Robert Kennedy made a very interesting speech in 1968, which is one minute 50 long, which I'd like just to play to you to put this sort of the debate in context. I always advise students against putting you know, quotes into essays at the start, but I have two at the start, and then that's it. So. I'm going to allow myself some leeway here. Uh, so this, this commission which, uh, from Sarkozy, it, it, it wasn't actually looking at any specific policies as such. It was looking really at how we can get better economic metrics and look at the way in which policies are designed, implemented, and assessed. And significantly, as an example, in the executive summary of that report, the, these uh, economists no noted, and quoting, quoting now, Choices between promoting GDP and protecting the environment may be false choices once environmental degradation is appropriately included in our measurement of economic performance. So too, we often draw inferences about what are good policies by looking at what policies have promoted economic growth. But if our metrics of performance are flawed, so too may be the inferences that we draw. So, and, and actually similarly as well, that was picked up um, in 2006 and 2010, David Cameron made two speeches and actually commissioned the Office of National Statistics, the ONS in, in, in Britain, in the UK, to look at other measurements of, of well-being society too. So th this is on the agenda, and actually, uh, I think, which is encouraging, just, just down the, the drive from here in the Stormont Hotel, I think in September of this year, I wasn't at it, unfortunately, but there was a, a Measuring What Matters in Northern Ireland conference, um, I think organized by the Carnegie Trust in the UK, uh, which I think the Minister of Finance attended. Um, and there was representatives from Scotland, the Republic of Ireland, uh, local academics from Queens, and, and statisticians from Israel were there. And they were looking at what measuring what matters in Northern Ireland too. So, so often the problem we have with climate change, going back to what Anna said at the, st at the start, is that there is, and obviously so, particularly when elections are coming, and we only have to look at the local news coming from Westminster at the moment, and the Conservative Party and, and, and the coalition government, Short-term economic growth is always priority for everything. It is the currency, really, of political debates and of how a government does. You know, if the economic gro economy is growing or GDP is up, the, the government is performing, and, and therefore they, they, they get elected again. But perhaps, interestingly, maybe at the time of the, the last recession, um, there is a wider debate about looking at what really matters and what we count as, as, as progress. Um, and the second quote, and the last quote, I promise, I'm, I'm going to read to you, is, is one from uh, Ben Bernanke. Ben, I'm not sure of his pronunciation either. But he's a very important and influential man. He's the chair of the US Federal Reserve, or the Fed, as it's commonly known. So he's responsible for monetary policy in, in the United States. Um, sort of a loose comment from a chairman of the Federal Reserve can often wipe billions or add billions to the stock prices around the world. So when he starts talking about uh, looking at economics differently, I think it's, it, it's something we could maybe take notice of too. And what he said, so we're talking about looking beyond GDP and new metrics. As we, quote, as we think about new directions for economic measurement, we might start by reminding ourselves of the purpose of economics. Textbooks describe economics as a study of the allocation of scarce resources. That definition may, may indeed be the what, but it's certainly not the why. The ultimate purpose of economics, of course, is to understand and promote the enhancement of well-being. So, I think this, this sort of move or a direction to sort of question short-term economic growth, what constitutes it, especially using GDP as a sort of proxy for economic growth, um, I, I think it's good that we're looking now at that why of economics, because I think this, this leads to some of the problems we have in tackling climate change. And 
Um, important in this regard is a book many of you may, may, may have heard of or may have read. Uh, Tim Jackson in 2009 wrote a book about prosperity without growth, which on the sound of it obviously is, you know, sounds counterintuitive. Uh, it, of course, depends on how you define prosperity and how you define growth. But he posed a fundamental question, which was, what can prosperity look like in a finite world with limited resources and a population of the world which by 2050 is going to be 9 billion? And a lot of these figures and targets we have are looking at mid-century points, 2050 or sooner, or the end of the century. So I think it's also important to stress that you know, if we're rethinking our single, our single focus um, on short-term economic growth or, or G crude measures of GDP, it's not because people want to turn the clock back, you know, we want to sort of go back and live in a cave, which is often the argument thrown back at people like this, or that we somehow reject modernity. Um, it's because there is a huge dilemma which we face, really, um, and that is, as I stated at the start, you know, in pursuing growth-based ba growth prosperity today, we're undermining and actually completely diminishing the basis for our well-being for life in the future, because we are, our economy is fueled by uh, carbon, fossil fuels, which we are using up at a, at a large rate, which won't be there forever. So we have a planet with finite ecological limits, and I'm going to look at those limits shortly. Um, before I do that, actually, I just want to say something about economics as a discipline. Um, it's funny when climate change is talked about, in fact, any issue is talked about, it's often always when, only when the economist speaks that these things are taken seriously. You know, econ economics, I hope there's no economists in the audience, or maybe if there are, I'd be interested in their views. But it is seen as somehow um, almost an untouchable social science, as if everything economists say it, you know, carries some kind of great truth. I think it's fair to say that it's questioned less than other social sciences. So it's also fair to say, and I think this has been acknowledged, that you know, climate change has fundamentally challenged a lot of conventional economic thinking. We think back to the Stern Review, the Stern Report, which is so influential in 2007. When, when he said, he admitted, climate change is the greatest and widest ranging, widest ranging market failure ever seen. Um, and in short, we simply can't leave it to markets alone to fix the problems of climate change, because markets do not automatically solve the problems that they create. For, especially in the case of harmful externalities, like CO2 emissions, unregulated markets produce too much CO2 because they do not put a price on the damage that they do, their, their uh, external damages. So, and I think the message for us, even here as well, what we actually need is some sort of proactive strategic interventions by governments and regulation in, in terms of uh, either carbon taxing or pricing. But of course, I listened to the radio on the way up here today. Um, George Osborne was saying, um, my political philosophy is against taxes. Nobody wins elections going to taxes. So what we have, we have this problem of we need to put a price on carbon. Economists across the board accept it. But politically, in the short term, it's a very hard thing to do. It's a very hard political sell. I think this explains some of the op opposition we have to it. And then again, actually, some people also talk about, you know, going back to 2008 and, you know, when everything apparently was fantastic before 2008. Well, if you think about it, in 2008, before the recession, it was based on um, an unsustainable housing bubble. And I think the levels of UK consumer debt in 2008 were 1.5 trillion pounds, which was actually higher than GDP at the time. So it's not as if traditional, you know, economic growth was necessarily a... Uh, brilliant work for us too as well. There's a few slides here now um, which I want to show because it, uh, I'm not going to spend very long on them because I, I, I want to move on. I can come back to them afterwards if people want to look at them and they may well be familiar to people in the audience here anyway. But these are actually slides that show that following a certain level of actually in, uh, income growth and ec economic, higher income and economic growth, that that uh, increase in income doesn't actually appear to advance. And in some cases, some people actually argue, impedes human happiness and well-being. This is also known as the Eterland paradox. So along the bottom of the scale, I'm not sure if people can see it with the lights, but there's just GDP per person uh, in US dollars. So from nothing at the bottom to $25,000. And at the left-hand side is the mean of percent people who are sort of happy and satisfied with life. And obviously, that's an important distinction to make. Up to a certain level, you know, extreme poverty, people below $1,000, $5,000 a year, uh, people aren't very happy with life. And it's one thing to say, actually, we're talking about how economic growth is not always, always necessarily a good thing. Obviously, in, in a lot of the world, I mean, it's population 7 billion, 1, 1 billion people living in poverty, to a certain level, absolutely is. We need a certain amount of income and growth 
because we need the basics of life, we need shelter and food and so forth. But beyond a certain level, you can see if you look up the charts, certain countries with, with here it seems to be somehow around the $15,000 mark, but over a certain level, people are equally ha happy with life as those on the right-hand side, that's Switzerland and the US, at the very top right, you can't read it, who are the highest earning countries. When you look at, at life expectancy at birth versus the average income, again, the, the, cap, the income is along the bottom here, up to 50,000. We've got Norway, United States there. But much further back down, even around $15,000, countries like Costa Rica and Chile and Malta have the same life expectancy as countries where people earn three times as much. And it's amazing how often actually this sort of trend is repeated. Uh, this is infant mortality against GDP per capita. So obviously very poor countries, huge infant mortality. But when you get to a certain level of income, again, Chile, Cuba, Saudi Arabia, New Zealand, people are earning much less money, but the, their infant mortality rates are just the same as the wealthiest countries in the world as well. And the final metric as well, just to sort of re repeat the pattern, is on uh, participation in education, which is another metric of well-being and good life and social progress. So under a certain level of income, people aren't, aren't uh, participating in education very much, but after a certain level, participation levels in education are just as high in countries with lower or medium average incomes as the very richest as well. So the assumption that economic growth and, and higher income means that uh, we're automatically going to have an improved quality of life uh, across, doesn't hold across a range of metrics. And there's also a related debate to this, which we don't have time to look into today, but you may well be familiar with um, the spirit level arguments in terms of equality. There are also huge implications for equality in economic growth, um, because this graph shows very briefly um, against a range of 10 or 11 metrics, again, I'm not sure if you can read it, uh, covering things like life expectancy, maths and literacy, infant mortality, homicides, imprisonment, teenage birth, child obesity, melting and social mobility. Along the bottom here, we have income inequality. So the higher the income inequality, the countries on the right-hand side, and on the left-hand axis is the worse those social problems are. And it actually shows that, as the title of the graph says, uh, health and social problems are actually worse in, in more unequal countries. So, just coming to the, the, the end of that sort of second line of argument, and I really just want to recap and say that the economic growth, which is so prized by politicians and sound bites and, and, and news headlines, is literally fueled by burning carbon-based uh, fossil fuels, which, which are finite. I mean, we have finite resources, and that this is unsustainable. I really now want to look at just how finite those resources actually are. Um, you may well be familiar with the peak oil debate, which is something which is running and running and, and continues to run, and no doubt will we'll still do so. Um, we looked at some late, latest research from 2012 and 2013. And the short, the short, long and short of it is that we really do need to reduce our dependency on oil. Um, there's a huge correlation, as you'd imagine, between economic performance and, and oil oil production, the price of oil, sorry, rather, in the world. Ten of the last 11 recessions in the United States were preceded by a hike in, uh, in oil prices, and we should be particularly aware of that in Northern Ireland, because we are extremely vulnerable and dependent on importing all our, our oil, and it's 98, 99% of our fossil fuels, I might, I, might, I might be, sorry, energy supply, I might be corrected on that. Um, and we know, because it's dominated the, the news, certainly over uh, in England, at Westminster recently, about energy prices, um, and energy prices do erode family budgets. The recent PricewaterhouseCoopers study of the UK economy showed that housing and utility bills now account for 26% of family budgets, and that they add to the increase to fuel poverty. And unfortunately, Northern Ireland, of all the regions in the UK, has the highest levels of fuel poverty as well. So the fact that um, looking at the, at the supply of oil and the figures for oil, that we may have actually reached a tipping point in global supply in 2005, which is this graph here from Murray and King. King is Sir David King, who was the, previous, the government's chief scientific advisor for many years and a respected figure. Um, their argument was that this tipping point in supply was maybe reached uh, production in 2005, and that now conventional crude oil production actually hasn't risen to match increasing demand since then. So, the argument here is that production is now in inelastic, it's what they call inelastic, so it's unable to respond to rising demand, and this leads to wild price swings, which we've all noticed at the petrol pumps where we're buying home oil. So only by moving away from fossil fuels can we both ensure a more robust economic outlook and address the challenges of climate change. 
and this is actually just, I haven't got time to go through this now, but again, I can come back at the end. This is actually a more recent, the latest research in terms of peak oil and when we may actually hit that in terms of timings, timings and scenarios. So, if we have possible problems with oil supply and peak oil, um, these, these problems really are thrown into sort of sharper relief, I think are even, even more concerning when we, when we look at the sort of maybe lack of political action or the way that climate change is, is pushed down the political agenda when other priorities seem to take over. Um, because there's been a lot of research recently over actually based in the city of London by a carbon tracker, uh, a group of financial analysts who basically study and forecast commodities and look at bubbles and commodities and products and they've been looking at the carbon, carbon as a commodity for a while and looking at how much carbon uh, there are in the books of the major oil, coal and gas companies in terms of reserves. Um, and they come up with some startling figures which have been neatly encapsulated um, by Bill McKibben who's written a lot about the, the dangers we are facing. And, and the three numbers here, you can do the maths is sort of the shorthand slogan for, for putting this in context, but there's three key numbers. One is two degrees, one is 565 gigatons, and the other is 2,795. Now, they don't naturally roll off the tongue, but when you, when you look at the significance of them and how they relate, um, it is concerning. Two degrees, this is sort of the accepted global target which you have by uh, 2050, uh, by which global uh, mean temperatures shouldn't rise to sort of keep us within certain tipping points of, of climate change really harming us based on the sort of pre-industrial average. So two degrees is the most we can let uh, the mean temperatures grow. At the moment, I think it's something like 0.885% temperatures have grown since, since sort of the start of an industrialized Realization. So that's, that's the figure which we're, we're focused on. 565 gigatons, the second number, that's what science esti scientists estimate that we can emit, put into the atmosphere by 2050 and still have a reasonable, and by reasonable they mean 80%, four out of five chance of staying within that two degrees target. So that's basically what we've got left to burn. 2795 is actually the amount of carbon already in the proven coal, oil, and gas reserves of fossil fuel companies studying their books. Um, so this is the carbon that has sort of been accounted for and planned for and, and planning to burn, uh, which is five times what we can safely do. So, and I think this, in a sense, this, this encapsulates the whole problems of, of the issue because to meet uh, or to have an 80% chance of staying within our two-degree two target, we're going to have to keep 80% of that in the ground, basically. I know Mary Robinson came out recently at the last IPC report and simply said, we just need to keep our carbon in the ground. But it's very hard to do politically because you know, the economic value of 80% of that is something in the region of $20 trillion. The figures aren't precise, obviously it depends on markets, but it's a huge amount of money. So, and that basically is the problem. And it's not even that it's just in the ground. In many instances, actually, in reality, that, that those reserves actually exist because um, Economically, com companies, it's already counted into their share prices. Uh, it's companies borrow against it as an asset. And some nations even base their budgets on the potential reserves from it. So this slide simply shows various scenarios. Sorry, the, the print is too small for you. Um, but it basically shows various scenarios. There are two red lines there. I don't know if you can see them. And it's basically showing the chances we have, if you can see the two dotted red lines at the top, two estimates, one from the IPCC, one from Carbon Tracker and the other lines are from the IEA, the International Energy Authority, about when we may or may not hit this 2% target. The most optimistic scenario is sort of the light blue line. Um, but what we need to do basically is to get those, those, those lines bending back down, bending back down towards 2%. So these are various estimates depending on uh, which body and figures you look at of when we may or may not hit or break that, that carbon budget, which would be a problem for us. So, I don't want to be too doom and gloom uh, because I think there are lots of things we can do and there are lots of opportunities, but just trying to sort of put the debate in some kind of, of context. Um, of course, there are many people who accept these general figures about we have too much carbon and fossil fuels and we can't burn them because of the damage it will do, but they're not, too, they're not worried about it. They're not worried about it because, and this is sort of the discourse of hope or optimism, in many ways they say that technology um, will come to the rescue. You know, innovations in technology, improved efficiency in technology, new technologies yet, yet to be discovered will come along to our rescue. And what they will do is, and this is sort of the, um, the, the economic term, if we have decoupling, decoupling will allow for us to uh, 
to meet these targets. Decoupling simply is we'll be able to continue with economic growth and burning fossil fuels, but we'll be able to take away the carbon emissions from that. So we can decouple the carbon em emissions, which are the negative, the bad, from the economic progress. So once we learn how to do that better, we'll find we can continue with carbon-based economic growth and we'll be fine. Um, now, I mean, this, of course, is, 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 is the holy grail. It's what people are looking for. Um, so, you know, the argument, the positive argument here, the technological fix is that, you know, te technological advances means the, the economy can continue to grow without breaking our limits or running out of resources. But the question is, how, how fast will technology have to keep up? Um, how efficient and how clever is, you know, human society, human ingenuity going to be to do that? This graph, I'm not going to spend very long on, again, I can come back to, but essentially it was looking at the carbon intensity of economic production in 2007 on the left-hand side. It was 768 grams in economic output. And to get to a target in 2050 of staying within the, well, the target at the time, actually, sorry, was 450 parts per million, which is a lower target from a previous IPC report. But just to show you the scale of how fast we're going to improve our technology and we have to decouple our economic gro growth, it's, it's a scale of magnitude of something like 130 times. So that's how much we're going to have to use technology and new innovations and advances to meet, to meet, our, to meet our target. So what I've done really there is sort of set out some of the issues and some of the problems. Um, but, and again, this is where I've been interested in maybe the debate afterwards. You know, what can we do now um, to you know, to, to take action rather than simply to sort of, and that is a problem because sometimes I think climate change shouldn't be a left or right issue. Um, it's certainly not, and I think it's positive in all Ireland, if, if you excuse it, an orange or a green issue. So it should be something in which there is sort of uh, cross-party support and public support, um, but, but, the, but there's not. And I think one thing which is actually absolutely crucial, there's, two, there's three things on this, on this slide which we can maybe do. Increased public awareness and understanding. We need to pay for the cost of carbon and we need accelerated research. Two of those things um, are within the gift of the assembly, I think we can do. Certainly public awareness, I think we need to understand it and I think a much better job needs to be done in people understanding the debates. Paying the cost of carbon means arguments about bringing carbon taxes. That is without, you know, that's without the remit of, outside the remit rather of the assembly. I mean, that's, that needs international cooperation and agreements. So there's little we can read about that at the moment, <coughs> although they are desirable. The third thing is accelerated research. You know, rapid increase in technology to produce a low carbon economy. And the answer to that, um, as I just moved to, to the last slide, is even actually, if you were here a couple of weeks ago, there's a showcase of three universities in Northern Ireland, Queen's, University of Ulster, and ourselves. Um, Northern Ireland has a history of being world class or world leading in engineering, um, in, in fighting cancer and cancer medicine. There's no reason why, with the engineering background and the technology, that we shouldn't really refocus our economic efforts and research efforts on working on low carbon and zero carbon technologies. I mean, I think that's something we definitely have to do. Uh, I don't really need to talk much about the Northern Ireland policy context, because everybody here will, will know it. I mean, there was the UK Climate Change Act, which Anna mentioned in 2008. Scotland grabbed the bull by the horns and did their own act the following year. We've yet to do so in Northern Ireland, and that's some sort of prevarication or delay. Um, looking at, I mean, there are certainly targets here, look at the programme for government target and there's a cross-departmental working group of climate change, et cetera. But generally speaking, I think it's fair to say that we've yet to address it with the urgency that we needed to. Um, and again, as Anna said at the start, it's win-win. If, you know, if we invest in a low-carbon economy, you get job opportunities in housing and renewables, uh, greater energy independence, security, reduction of fuel poverty. Um, really, I mean, summing up, I think this is really a question of political will. It's political will, and it's a question of taking ownership of the issue in Northern Ireland, it's showing leadership. And then it's thinking about legacy as well, because I was thinking the other day, um, 2050 is often talked about as being the state. And the problem is, and it's, I think the whole psychology of climate change I've been looking at recently, it's quite interesting, 2050 seems so far away, we can put it off. I was thinking, I've, um, I've lived in here in Belfast for, for 21 years, I have four children, my youngest is nine. In 2050, he'll be my age, he'll be 45. So 2050, you know, I still feel quite young. <laughs> I think I've got some years ahead of me, hopefully. So it's not forever. We keep kicking the can down the road. We really can't do that. Um, and the thing which I'm researching, looking at the moment again, is sort of what's holding us back? What are the political reasons? What's the, the public psychology? Why do we have this inertia? And it's certainly not the science, just starting with what you said at the start, because the science 
is settled. If anybody doesn't agree on the science now, we're never going to convince them. You know, it's the politics and the economics and what we need to do. Um, thank you for your attention.